21. A nation under great judgment. And God says, I search for a man among them who would build up the walls and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Thus I have poured out my indignation on them. Mm -hmm. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Mm -hmm. Their way I have brought upon their heads, declares the Lord mm -hmm. God. God looks for a man to build up the wall and to stand in the gap. Last week we were thinking a little bit about that matter of building up the wall and following God's pattern for building in our lives and seeing within the walls of Jerusalem God's pattern knit into that construction. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth. So I want us to think a little bit this week about this matter of standing in the gap. What does it mean? What is God um, pointing us to? and challenging with. What does it mean to stand in the gap? It is a priestly role to stand before the Lord. It was the privilege of uh, the priesthood to be able to go and to stand before God on behalf of the people. We have a great high priest, don't we, in the Lord Jesus, the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father, whoever lives to make intercession for us. It's a priestly role to make intercession, to pray on behalf of others. Praise God, we have that great high priest who is able to understand us perfectly, having lived as a man and one who prays for us. He intercedes for us. And it's our privilege to intercede for others. He has made us a kingdom of priests Priest. unto our God. Turn to the book of Exodus <clears throat> and chapter 28. I want you to see that this was a pattern even within the nation of Israel that priests <coughs> should minister to the Lord on behalf of men. <coughs> Just read one verse here, and it's verse 12, Exodus 28. You shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of memorial for the sons of Israel. Aaron shall bear the names before the Lord on his two shoulders for a memorial. He would bear the names of the sons of Israel and stand before the Lord and so we have something of that role and privilege to go and to stand before Lord, the Lord and to bring people before him, bear their names before the Lord and to pray for them. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Psalm 106 refers to a man who did just that, who stood in the gap. Moses, <clears throat> we read the account in Exodus chapter 32, but here it's outlined for us in the history of Israel. Psalm 106 and verse 19, it says they made a calf in Horeb. Well, God's servant, God's humble servant was before the Lord, up the mountain, they made a calf, worshipped a molten image. Thus they exchanged their glory for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their saviour, who had done great things in Egypt, wonders in the land of Ham, and awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them. Judgment was decreed. Had not Moses... His chosen one did what? Stood, stood, in the stood in the breach, stood in the gap. 
we get a beautiful picture there of a man. God looked for a man. God was about to destroy his people, but God was still willing to look for a man who would stand in the gap, build up the wall, stand in the gap, that God should not pour forth his wrath. indignation and wrath mm -hmm. upon them. And he found one, a humble man, <clears throat> his servant Moses. He turned his wrath away from destroying them. So I want us to look at one other example and some principles regarding our standing before the Lord. If you'd like to turn to the book of Genesis and chapter 18, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man, and as in the days of Lot. Lot. And here we have the days of Lot. And did God, man, did God find a man who would stand in the gap? Yes. Yes, yes he did. A man called Abraham. Abraham, God's friend. Mm. You want to be a friend of the Lord? You want to be able to say what a friend we have in Jesus and hope that one day I'll be able to say what a friend I have in you. Well, our father Abraham gave us a wonderful example. Genesis 18, then I'll read from verse 16. The men rose up from there, looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Mm. For I've chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. Their sin is exceedingly great. Is the sin of Sodom exceedingly grave? Yeah. Yeah. God says so. I will go down now, see if they've done entirely according to its outcry which has come to me. If not, I'll know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, while Abraham was standing where? Before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Wilt thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from thee to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from thee. Shall not the judge, judge of all the earth deal justly? So the Lord said, I, if I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I'll spare the whole place on their account. Mm. And Abraham answered and said, Now behold, I ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. Mm. Wilt thou destroy the whole city because of five? He said, I'll not destroy it if I find 45 there. And he spoke to him again, yet again, and said, Suppose 40 are found there. He said, I'll not do it on account of the 40. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he said, Now behold, I ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there said, I will not destroy it on account of the twenty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry. I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. He said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. Mm. And as soon as he finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned. to pick up on a few things 
And the first, I want you to notice in this episode that it was God who initiated the process. Mm -hmm. It was God who initiated the process. God revealed to Abraham what he was about to do. It was God's providence that Abraham saw that Sodom and Gomorrah were under the judgment and wrath of God. Did anybody else understand it? No. I don't know. We have no mention of it, but Abraham did because God revealed it to him. He understood the ways of God. He understood the righteousness of God. He understood the holiness of God. He saw the wickedness and he understood that God's wrath was about to be poured out upon these wicked cities because it was revealed to him. How many people understand that God's wrath is about to be poured out in the earth? Not many. Not many. Not many. Do you this morning? Why do you understand? Because God has made it known to you. God in his amazing grace has opened your eyes and revealed to you what he is about to do. I hope you don't lose sight of the privilege of that and the awesome responsibility that God has brought you into something of his divine plan and work. And why has he done it? He's still looking. He's still looking for a man. To do what? Stand in the breach. Stand in the gap. And did Abraham go and stand before the Lord? Yes. When he realized what was about to take place, did he go? Yes. And did he stand before the Lord? Yes. And make intercession? He did. Well, we need to understand that that is why God has made known to us the days in which we live. Jesus told the parable in Luke chapter 18 and said, When the Son of Man comes, will he find a faithfulness? And what kind of faithfulness was he referring to? A faithfulness in prayer faithfulness in prayer. He refers to this widow, helpless, hopeless woman, who goes and makes an appeal to the judge. Well, that is what Jesus is talking about, dear friends. Are we going to be faithful in the last days? Are we going to keep on? Are we going to keep on standing before the Lord and pleading? And interceding, knowing that God's wrath is about to be poured out in the earth. And pleading for mercy. Pleading that God will still spare in wrath that he'll remember mercy. Amen. There's not too many people that understand, you know. God initiated. God gave Abraham a concern, a burden for even Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that just came out of the blue, was it? Abraham had already had um, something of dealings with Sodom and Gomorrah. This was something that was already upon his heart mm -hmm. when God revealed it to him. That's how God works, yeah. dear friends. What has God put upon your heart? Maybe it's an individual, maybe it's a group, maybe whatever. A burden. Do you have a burden from the Lord? The Hebrew word for burden is massa. It means something to be carried, something to be born. Now, 
<clears throat> when God instituted a priesthood, guess what he gave the priests to do? They had things to carry, didn't they? When God moved, they all had to carry something. They didn't all carry the same thing. I just leave everything behind. Well, I'll just get this box. No, they, they all had different things that they had to carry. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same with us, dear friends. God has instituted a pattern. The burden that he lays upon us might be might differ from person to person. Mm -hmm. But God has a burden for you. Mm -hmm. God has those individuals or situations or people or whatever that... He wants you to bear. He wants you to go and stand before him and make intercession regarding. And we need to understand what they are. I want to just run through <clears throat> four verses quickly. Turn to Isaiah chapter 13. How does God lay burdens upon us? Well, they can come in various ways. Isaiah 13, verse 1, the oracle, the burden, the burden, concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. How did this burden come? Jesus. Something that God revealed to Isaiah. The burden regarding Babylon that Isaiah saw. Now, it might not be that we get some divine vision in the middle of the night. It might just simply be that God allows us to see something mm -hmm. and, it, and it touches our hearts. Mm -hmm. You know, one day uh, God said to Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. And, mm -hmm. and, and Jeremiah was just watching the potter at work. But when he looked, he saw it in a particular way and, it, and God spoke to him. You know, God can speak to us through things that we see mm. and put a burden upon our hearts. Mm. You know, many years ago, <clears throat> God took um, a man down to um, the streets of New York and he saw the drug addicts, he saw the gangs. David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson. And, and he saw these things and God laid a burden upon that man's heart. Mm. And after that came forth, intercession because this man had a burden about what God had shown him he'd seen it mm -hmm. God had touched his heart it lay heavy upon him and he began to stand before the Lord and, and to call upon the Lord on behalf of these helpless and hopeless people you get the picture yes. turn to Nahum chapter 1 page 1501 Nahum. Just before the H's, if that helps. <clears throat> After Micah, if it doesn't. The oracle of Nineveh, the burden of Nineveh. Mm. How did this burden come? It was, it was a burden about the place for this man, Nahum. It was a city. Mm. Now God may just give you a burden for a particular place. It might be where you live. It might be somewhere else. God just lays the thing upon your heart. Why does he do that? Because he wants you to go and to stand before him and to intercede. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Habakkuk. Turn on a few pages to the book of Habakkuk and chapter 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet saw. Here we have it again. This was something that Habakkuk saw that became a burden to him. It was like something upon him that he was having to carry. It was a burden from God. How long, O oh Lord, will I call for help and thou wilt not hear? Mm. I cry out to thee violence, yet thou dost not say, Why hast thou, <clears throat> why dost thou make me to see iniquity? Why do you see the things that you see? 
Are you just unfortunate? Do you believe in fortune? No. no. Why do you see the things that you see? Why do you come across the things that you see and that they so deeply trouble your heart? Well, the strength to see. Because God has made you see these things. And God can put a burden upon you. Something he wants you to carry. Something he wants you to go. And to stand before him. And to beseech the throne of grace about. It might be some particular sin. Some group. Some thing that's happening. Why does God allow me to see this thing? Why do you make me see it Lord? Why does it bother me so much? The oracle. The burden. Zechariah. <clears throat> and chapter 9. Here's another burden. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 1. The burden, the oracle of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach with Damascus as its resting place for the eyes of men, especially of all the tribes of Israel are toward the Lord. The burden the oracle <clears throat> of the word of the Lord. We can be reading God's word, dear friends. <clears throat> and a burden can come about a particular thing from the word of the Lord, the burden of the word of the Lord. God lays a scripture. God, God lays something upon our hearts. We read it. And, and a burden comes through the word of God and rests upon us. Why? So that we should go and stand before the Lord. Amen? Amen. Number two. Turn to Second Chronicles and chapter 29. The second thing I want us to understand and think about this morning. Second Chronicles. In the days of Hezekiah, we get something of a time of revival. And what was it? What, what were the things that this king understood? That he was able to bring something of a turning to the Lord and bring about a revival within the nation. Well, this is one of them. Second Chronicles 29. He says to the priests, verse 11, My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to minister to him, to be his ministers, to burn incense. There was a, an altar of incense, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Well, there's one in the book of Revelation, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And what's in it? Prayers. The prayers of the saints. the saints, dear friends. Priests. Are you a priest this morning? Yes. Priests. Do not be negligent. God has chosen you to stand before him. What a privilege <coughs> to carry everything to God in prayer. Not everyone can do that. But he's made us priests. And as priests, he's chosen us to go and to stand before First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. Read in verse one. First of all, then, what comes first? First of all, then, I urge <coughs> prayers supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings be 
made on behalf of all men, the kings, all who were in authority, in order that we may lead tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So first of all then, he wants us to stand before him in prayer, supplication, intercessions, with thanksgivings, make our request known unto the Lord. Turn to Mark chapter 11, number 3. The third thing we need to think on this subject. I'm not going to spend much time on this one. We've, it keeps coming up again and again. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus says, Whenever you stand praying, if you're going to go and stand before the Lord, what do you need to do? Forgive. Forgive, Forgive dear friends. Otherwise you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against any one so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your transgressions if you do not forgive neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions that's quite a statement isn't it but it's there in scripture if we're going to stand before God, dear friends, there needs to be no bitterness or unforgiveness in our hearts. We must forgive. We must forgive. Number four. Here's a challenge, dear friends, which will transform your prayer life. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Your life is going to be changed. Matthew chapter 6. Your prayer life is going to be transformed. I read from verse 5. Familiar verses these. When you pray, don't be an actor. Don't be <clears throat> as the hypocrites, the actors. What's an actor? It's somebody who's putting on a performance. For who? Men. Our prayers should never be to be heard by men. Never. Whenever they are, They love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they are for reward in full. If your prayers are to be heard by others, let's just hope they answer them. Because that's all you're going to get. You get nothing from him. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room. When you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. When you're praying, do not mean, use meaningless repetition, as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they're going to be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. <laughs> pray then, in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Mm. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever and ever. Amen. Okay, this is what I want you to think about. There are some words. Jesus gives us a pattern for our praying, doesn't he? Yes. There are some words which are missing. And I want to tell you what they are. Because they need to be missing from your prayers as well. Okay, here's the first one. I. I. Can you see I anywhere there? No. 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 And yet, Let's be honest, in our prayers, how many times do we use that word? Quite a lot. Let me give you another one. <clears throat> My. <clears throat> My's not there, is it? No. No, it's not there. I and my and me are not there anywhere. If you can so change your prayer life that I and me and my are no longer in your prayers, I would put it to you that your prayer life will be What is that? We? Mm -hmm. Us? Our? It's a collective. But not me, I, and mine. It's a collective. Do we see that pattern in Scripture? Mm. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. Here's one of the great intercessory prayers in Scripture. Here's a man listed as a great intercessor by God himself. You can see, see the same thing if you look at um, Moses' prayer before the Lord. Let's just look at a few verses. I'll read from verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. <coughs> what? We have sinned. We committed iniquity, acted wickedness, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from thy commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not lis listened to thy servants, the prophets who spoke in thy name, mm. to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Mm. Righteousness belongs to thee, O Lord, but to us, mm. us open shame, mm. as it is this day, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel those who are nearby, those who are far away, in all the countries to which thou hast driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which they have committed against thee. Open shame belongs to us. us. O Lord, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongs compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. I challenge you to find an I, my, or me. <coughs> it's not there, dear friends. And when the disciples asked the Lord to teach them how to pray, the pattern that he gave them had no eyes in, had no mys in, and had no me's in. It's a challenge, isn't it? Prayer life will be transformed if you can eradicate I, me, and mine. Mm. 
There is one exception in the sense that, obviously, if we have personal sin that we, we need to confess before the Lord, that's, that's the proviso. Obviously, we need to do that. But other than that, dear friends, take the challenge. Turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, number five. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes in chapter one. Guard your steps as you go to the house of the Lord, draw near to listen mm -hmm. rather than to offer the sacrifice of bulls. Yeah. For they do not know they're doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore let your words be few. few. Do we know how to pray? No. The Bible says we do not know how to pray. Do we need the Lord's help? Yes. yes. Absolutely. And we have a helper. Who is he? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8. We know not how to pray as we ought, but he, the Holy Spirit, the helper, reveals to us the mind and the will of God. We need revelation from God, dear friends, in our prayers, don't we? We can chatter away to God. But are we listening? Because it needs to be a conversation. And we need to hear. We need revelation from Him and understanding in how He wants us what are you wanting to do in this? In all your ways, know him. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him. Lord, what is it that you're trying to do in this situation? We're living in days, dear friends, where we really need to seek the Lord and to, and to hear from him. What is he trying to do? Otherwise, we, we, we can run around like headless chickens, trying to feed the prodigal in the pig, in the pig pen. Mm -hmm. What was God trying to do with that man? Bring him to repentance, bring him to a godly sorrow. Mm -hmm. Show him that he was, his life was filthy, he was in awful darkness. I think the church would have, would, would have had him out of there, giving him a steak dinner and some gravy and chips, told him that God loved him and had a wonderful plan for his life, and not even realized that God had sent the famine. Mm -hmm. God had dragged him into the darkness and the pit because he wanted him to come to repentance recognized that he was on his way to hell. Mm. We need understanding, dear friends, from God, don't we? Yes. So draw near to listen, and not to offer the sacrifice of fools. fools. Don't be hasty in making your prayer lists. Seek the Lord, and look to the Holy Spirit. Psalm 134. If we're going to stand before the Lord, we need to understand this. Psalm 134. Behold, bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord, who do what? Who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hand to the sanctuary and bless, bless the Lord. What is your primary <coughs> responsibility when you stand before God? Bless to bless him. him. To bless him. 
Lord, may my thanksgiving, may my praise, my, may my prayers bless you. May all these things be pleasing to you. May you so quicken me by the Holy Spirit that, that my prayers this day won't have an eye and a me and a mine. That they might be according to the will of God. Because you're opening my understanding to your ways. I'm seeing what it is that you're trying to do. I'm seeing the purposes of God. I'm knowing something of the heart of God for this situation. All oh, praise God. <clears throat> Two more. First Kings chapter 17. First Kings and chapter 17. Here's a man who understood not to try and drag the prodigal out the pig's hole. His name is Elijah. He's a Tishbite. <coughs> First Kings 17 verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand. What's the first thing we hear about this man? He stands before God. And, and what does God <clears throat> use this man to illustrate in the New Testament? Elijah, a man with a nature like ours, <coughs> prayed and it did not rain. He prayed again, it rained, <clears throat> poured from heaven, poured forth rain from heaven. The effectual prayer of a righteous, righteous man availeth much. Much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, but the one thing we know about him, he learned to stand before God. That's all we know about Elijah. We don't get his genealogy, we don't get anything about his background, we don't get what God had done in his life. All we get is this man had learned to go and stand before God. He could only do the same. When we can stand before God, dear friends, we can stand before kings. And Jesus said, in the last days, you will stand, you'll be hauled before kings and governors on account of my name. But if you can stand before God, you can stand before them. And you can stand without fear. And more importantly, You'll be able to stand with the word of God in your heart and on your lips. Last one, Second Chronicles chapter 34. Second Chronicles. The last great revival in the history of Israel. Last good king. They mourned for him. His name was Josiah. Only a young lad when he became king. But he finds the book of the law and he humbles himself. He's horrified at the way this nation has behaved sees that they need to come to repentance. In 2 Chronicles 34, I read from verse 29. The king sent, gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the house <coughs> of the Lord. And all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and all the people from the greatest to the least, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the law, the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. Then the king did what? Stood. He stood in his place. What 
what was wrong with the rest of the kings. They didn't realize where they were supposed to stand. He had all the people, he had all the elders. He gathered them all together. <coughs> he got them to stand in the right place. Where? stood before the Lord and they made a covenant before the Lord, the last great king of Israel. He stood in his place. He stood before the Lord. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Stand in your place. God has chosen you to stand before him. for a man to build up the wall and to stand in the gap. May he find men and women who will do that. May God bless his word to us. What a privilege. God has chosen us to stand before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the word of God and minister these simple truths to our hearts, Lord, because you've chosen us to stand before you, and that is the greatest privilege. Lord, may we indeed find that place. May we be that people, and when the Son of Man comes, may he find a faithfulness in us to stand before you. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name.